<laughs> no, I'm not going to leave. You're damn right I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here. If I left, it'd kill me. If I left this place and lost my home, I'd die in a week. I, I couldn't live. I couldn't, I couldn't extend it. So I'm like that old captain. I'm, by God, I'm going down the ship. I said, if the damn thing takes this mountain, I'm going along with it. I'd rather be dead for than to live without it. <laughs> Is that crazy? Damn stupid, huh? Okay. The people see that, they say the craziest man in God's real world, old Truman. Majestic Mount St. Helens and Spirit Lake were among Washington's most scenic recreation areas. Pristine lakes and streams, picturesque campgrounds, and stately Douglas fir forests of the Gifford Pinchot National Forest were part of a prime fishing, hiking, and hunting area enjoyed by three million visitors annually. Aside from its attraction for outdoor recreationists, St. Helens also received early attention from geologists. Although this youngest of the Cascade volcanoes had been dormant for over a century, occasional seismic activity and steaming hinted at a possible return to eruptive activity, with some geologists predicting a St. Helens eruption by the end of the century. The mountain shook for the first time in over a century on March 20th, 1980, when an earthquake measuring 4.1 on the Richter scale was recorded at 3.47 p.m. As seismic activity increased, speculation of a possible eruption also increased. Seven days later, the first steam and ash eruption occurred with intermittent eruptions continuing for nearly three weeks. After March 27th, the volcano became a regular national and local news item. The mountain also became a genuine concern for public agencies as the Gifford Pinchot National Forest evacuated at St. Helens Ranger Station and Governor Ray declared a state of emergency. Another part of the story made a folk hero out of 84-year-old Harry Truman, the unofficial guardian of the mountain and its surroundings. Now, if you look this over here, I'm north of Mount St. Helens, and I'm due east of Mount St. Helens. If you went down there to my, my dock and uh, put a compass across there, you'll find that north and south line are going up and down in the east and west. I'm completely east of Mount St. Helens, and my place is, and I'm completely north of it. There's no way that that mountain hasn't got enough stuff to come my way. On April 18th, the mountain again quieted down and stayed quiet for nearly three weeks. The public sighed in relief. Geologists grew apprehensive. Discovery of a bulge on the north side of Mount St. Helens added to the tension. On May 7th, the volcano resumed its rumblings. Small steam and ash eruptions continued on through the 14th, while the bulge grew an incredible four to five feet per day. All of this activity was but a prelude to another lull. Although volcanologists nervously monitored the mountain in quiet anticipation of a large eruption, no one could have foretold the catastrophic event that was to follow. On May 18th at 8.32 a.m., Mount St. Helens released a blast of searing ash and gases, a pyroclastic flow that devastated a 156 square mile area on the north side of the mountain. That same eruption sent a cubic mile of rock and debris skyward and a plume of ash and steam rose 70,000 feet. The 800 degree flows of hot ash and hydrogen sulfite shot down the mountainside as glacial material melted 30 foot walls of mud and debris roared down the north and south forks of the Tudor River. The 40 mile an hour mud flows destroyed buildings, bridges, trees, homes, everything along its path. Observers along the river that day witnessed a passive waterway transformed into a thick ooze laden with logs, mud, and volcanic debris. In some instances, tree trunks five feet in diameter gouged out the river bottom. Upon reaching the Columbia River, the mud flow clogged shipping channels. Large vessels were stranded, smaller ones damaged. At the mountain, the massive cloud of ash and steam continued to billow into the atmosphere, and as it ascended, upper-level winds carried it to the northeast. Within a few hours, Yakima, Washington, 85 miles from the volcano, was shrouded by the caustic powder. By noon, the city was in darkness. Other areas were similarly affected. Satellite pictures traced the ash movement out of Washington, into Idaho and Montana, across the country, 
and as it circled the world. Within hours after the eruption, emergency services were put into effect. Search and rescue teams combed square mile sections in hopes of finding survivors. Although some were found, others, including Harry Truman, never have been located. Rescue teams searching the Spirit Lake area reported a 200-foot earth fill where once the south shore of the lake existed. The impact of Mount St. Helens fury was realized once clouds lifted. Damage assessments on national forest land alone totaled over $134 million, including 20,000 acres devastated, thousands more heavily damaged or covered by four or more inches of ash, 12 bridges, 63 miles of road washed away, and Spirit Lake destroyed. 12% of the mountain was destroyed. And when the ash cleared, a huge black crater was left in place of the picturesque peak. Since May 18th, the mountain continued to vent small plumes of steam with periodic larger eruptions of steam and ash. On October 17th, a Forest Service camera recorded this pyroclastic flow, similar to the devastating flow of May 18th. Both the Forest Service and U.S. Geologic Survey continue to monitor the volcano, trying to find indicators that would give warning to all who would live or work near the mountain in the future. Indicators such as a lava dome, like this, that formed, was blown away and formed again. Activities of the mountain are unpredictable. Earthquakes and ash eruptions should be expected in the future while nature with the help of man has begun the long cleaning up process.